thank you, Kate, and everybody from Venice Audubon for inviting me. I'm really excited to be here and uh, talking about one of my favorite groups of birds, the shorebirds. And uh, there are so many reasons I love shorebirds. It's hard to even know where to begin. But one of, one of my favorite things is that they have such fascinating behaviors and you can actually get to watch them. So if you, for example, if you were watching warblers and fall migration, you might go outside and you're looking up in a tree and half the time you might just be looking at leaves or something like that because the warblers are kind of, there's things in the way so you can't see them. But shorebirds, they're out there on the beach. You can actually sit there and watch them the whole time and they're active, they're fascinating. They've got a variety of different behaviors. And um, it's true, as, as Kate mentioned, that uh, in the most of the year when they're in Florida, the plumages of, of shorebirds are very similar, but the shapes are different. And uh, hopefully at the end of this presentation, we're, we, we're not going to get into how to identify every kind of shorebird in Florida, but we'll go over uh, general tips for, for shorebird identification. And, and by the end, hopefully you'll be able to narrow the, uh, it down to, to the general group of shorebirds or, or maybe the exact species that you're, you're looking at. But um, I'll go through a little outline here first. Let's see. All right. Okay, so really quickly, I'll just mention what isn't a shorebird and I'll talk about shorebird names and then I'll go spend more time on the shorebird identification clues. And then I'll just go into depth about three shorebirds that are common locally in Venice. And then at the end, I'll talk about some shorebird resources. All right, so what isn't a shorebird? It's not, shorebirds aren't every bird that you find at the beach. For example, this bird, what, uh, does anyone know what kind of bird this is? You can put it in the chat if you want, although I'm not sure if I'll see it. Um, just think to yourself, would you call that a shorebird? Well, this is a reddish egret, um, which uh, sort of confusing. We, we call egrets waders. And in the old world, Eurasia, Africa, uh, Australia, they call them, uh, they call shorebirds waders. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. But, but egrets and herons are not shorebirds. Uh, you might see a boat tailed grackle at a beach. That's not a shorebird. Uh, this gulls and terns are related to shorebirds, but they're not considered shorebirds, not even this uh, juvenile royal tern here that's trying to smoke a cigar. Uh, so, these are the top species of shore. It wasn't really trying to smoke a cigar. Um, the top species of shorebirds that have been reported in Sarasota County in eBird. And if you don't know about eBird, I don't have time to get into it. You guys may have had a, a presentation about it at some point, but it's, it's a super useful resource to learn more about uh, birds and anywhere in the world. And, and I've mentioned a couple more things about it. And um, so this is by frequency of, of observation. So, the most frequently reported shorebird in the county is a killet, a <laughs> killdeer, and then willet is the second most, and you can see down the list. And uh, what I want you to look at on this list is not the common names, but look at the scientific name. And this is the first important point I want to make is you don't have to memorize any bird scientific names. And uh, each scientific name has two parts. It's two words. The first word's the genus. The second word is the species. If you at least look at the genus of the scientific name, that shows you how that bird is related to other birds because the English, English names are not that useful. For example, number two uh, is a willet um, and number eight is a greater yellow legs. Looking at those English names doesn't tell you anything about how they're related. But if you look at their scientific names, you can see that willet is a tringa, tringa semipalmata, and uh, the greater yellow legs is also a tringa. That means that those two birds have a lot in common. Uh, can you notice another species in there with the same genus? There, there are two more. One, the genus is repeated three times. Another, uh, it's twice. So we've got, uh, take a look on there. All right, the first one, killdeer, that's caradrius. And there's also snowy plovers and semi-palmated plover. That tells you those three birds are, are very similar in appearance in some ways. The next. One, we have Sanderling, that's the third one here, that's a Calidris, and then Lee Sandpiper, number six, that's also a Calidris. That tells you those two birds are related. But if you looked at the English name, Sanderling and, and Lee Sandpiper, that doesn't tell you anything about how they're related. So just looking at those uh, names helps you narrow down uh, what group of bird you may be looking at um, and, and how they're related. And I'll talk more about that later. 
and you did, you probably noticed the word uh, semi-palmated in there a few times, semi-palmated plover, semi-palmata for the willet. That's what this, this uh, arrow is pointing to this little bit of webbing between the feet of this uh, semi-palmated plover. That's what that's referring to if you hear that. I'm not, it's not an identification clue. You never really see it. And some birds that don't have semi-palmata or semi-palmate in their name have that also. So that's, but it's just a cool little thing. It does help them kind of swim too. So the ones, uh, the three species I'm going to talk about in a little bit are the willet, the sanderling, and the black-bellied plover. I'm not going to go into much detail on the killdeer because that's a more of an inland bird and it's, it's also pretty distinctive. Um, and then the same thing with the ruddy turnstone, it's very distinctive, so it's a little easier to identify. And uh, as far as the, with the turnstone, it's the only one in the genus Arenaria in the East Coast, so, so there's nothing else like that. So the three I'm going to talk about, Willet and Sanderling, those first two, there are lots of other birds or several, a few in that same genus as uh, either Willet or Sanderling, in those two genera, genera is the plural of genus. And then black-bellied plover, there are also a couple birds in that genus. Um, so I'm going to go into more detail about those three species. And then what you know, once you can narrow a bird down, maybe you go, it's, I'm not sure if it's a willet, but it looks very close. So maybe it's, it's, a, it's a tringa that's related to it. And I know it sounds a little bit tricky to be talking with these Latinized names. Um, but it, and, and, and again, don't get hung up on the pronunciation or anything like that, but it is very helpful to at least look at those to see the relationship. The first thing though that I want to talk about is the general clues for bird ID. This is the same three clues you would use to identify any kind of bird, whether it's a, a songbird or, a, you know, any, anything. There are only three general categories that you, you of clues you use to identify a bird. It's their distribution, uh, what they're doing, their behavior, and then what they look like. Those three things. Are, I mean, you could identify a bird by taking a blood sample and looking at the genetics, but you, you don't do that out in the field. So I'm going to use these three clues to go into more detail about shorebirds and um, talk about uh, how you narrow down your guess. So the very first clue is distribution. And that has three parts in general. It's the where, where are you finding the bird? That's why I've got that map up there. When, where in the world are they? And then the calendar on the bottom uh, left is the when for the bird. You know, what time of year are you seeing the bird? And um, I'm going to go into more detail about each of these. So the, the, district, the range is the first thing. It's where in the world are you? Which birds occur there? And that's really important because there are almost 11,000 species of birds in the world. But at any one place, there are only maybe a few hundred that you might see, or maybe a couple hundred common ones and a couple hundred rare ones. Um, so this is a typical range map. And uh, this is from the Audubon Online uh, Guide to Birds of North America. Cornell also has a very good guide to birds of North America. And one thing you'll notice is all these different uh, online guides or field guides have slightly different uh, differences in the map. And um, so for this one, if you looked at this, what time of year would you expect to see black belly plovers in Florida? So just in winter, because it's blue, and it looks like pretty dark blue, so pretty common. And then they breed, which you would assume would be what time of year? It's the summer, up in the high Arctic there, Alaska, northern Canada. But it would, and then migration, maybe you're thinking during the spring and fall there in the, in the middle of the continent, but this doesn't really tell you the whole picture because there are black-bellied plovers, as we'll see in just a second, year-round in Florida. Um, they're not breeding here, but this, um, it's kind of complicated actually when to get into when a bird is where, just because some birds are leaving, but there's still a few that are around. And I, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that later. But, um, but you can see if you, if you saw in, in midsummer a, a black-bellied plover in, um, Minnesota, for example, according to this map, that would be kind of unusual. Um, so the next thing you can narrow down where the bird is based on the habitat. And, and I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about that because it's pretty variable for, for shorebirds. And this is a classic, uh, you know, they're called shorebirds. You expect to find them at the shore. And um, the uh, shallow water is a great place for them to, to find. So we've got a western sandpiper here, 
and in the back it's a least sandpiper and this is on a kind of a sandy muddy beach with sharks and shells and what time what tide do you think would be best to find these shorebirds on the beach well if they're out on a mud flat and uh if they're feeding in the water then it's usually the outgoing tide is better but it really depends on the specific situation because you may be at a beach where at, at outgoing tide pretty soon they're a mile away and there's no way to see them because they're just too far away or they're around the corner behind some islands on the other hand maybe at high tide they're all concentrated in roosting an area where you can see them really well uh, so knowing the tides are important but also knowing the local conditions and where the birds uh, tend to hang out, it, are, that's also really important. And uh, an important thing for the high tide roosting birds is that's a sensitive time for them because they're resting uh, between when they're spending most of the time feeding out in these mud flats and, and they're easy, easily flushed sometimes if you get too close to them when they're roosting and then they're using up this valuable energy that they should be when they're trying to um, when they're actually trying to conserve the energy. Uh, so they're not shorebirds aren't always on the shore. This is a kill deer, and kill deer are found uh, more often. They are found on the shore, but more often they're up in grassy areas. And um, the kill deer has these two rings around its uh, neck and on on the chest. That's a it's the only one of these caradrius or the smaller plovers that has two bands. Uh, the, the young killdeer, however, only have one band, so they can be confusing. But all the other smaller plovers have just one band on their chest or even just part of a band, a partial band. Um, but the killdeer has two. So they're, they're found in upland habitats. Um, there are also some rare migrants that are found in upland habitats, especially wide open areas. A killdeer could be found in a fairly small ball field or a school yard or something like that. They don't need a huge open area, uh, but a, a bird like this upland sandpiper, if you're going to find one of those in migration in Florida, that's going to be a larger area, something like a big sod field or something like that. Um, and they breed also out in open areas. Uh, speaking of breeding shorebirds, this is a bar-tailed godwit that you all have. Yeah. Kate's presentation or Scott Widensall's presentations. Um, and this is up in the tundra. They breed in northern western Alaska and, and eastern Asia. And uh, they have these incredibly long migrations down to the South Pacific. Um, so this is another habitat where you would find shorebirds. The, the godwits in the wintertime, they're on beaches, but in the, breed, in the breeding season, like many other shorebirds, they're in tundra. And then this is a stretch of beach showing that uh, this is rack. Rack is the seaweed that's on the beach. And why do you think rack might be important for shorebirds? Um, so, so a lot of invertebrates will hang out in that rack and that's what shorebirds like to eat. And so uh, what some beaches do is what's, what's called beach raking, where they have these tractors and they come and rake up all the rack and uh, that's removing important shorebird habitat. And you know, of course, people don't like to be down the beach with all that seaweed, but uh, you can actually see any beach that has rack, usually there's enough nice sand areas where you can enjoy the, the sandy beach also. So it, it's raking the beaches, removing the rack is, is not good for shorebirds. But, but if you see a beach with a lot of rack, you can think, oh, this, this could be good for shorebirds. Beach like this with the rack and a nice wide beach, that's any time of year in Florida, we'll have shorebirds. And then even within a, a habitat like the beach, you can think about microhabitat. It gets even more specific. So in the swash zone, which is the zone where the waves hit the sand, it's that kind of wet area on the beach, uh, you'll see shorebirds dividing that area. The, the sanderlings are the little uh, birds that are running back and forth right at the shallowest bit of water probing in the ground. Whereas the, the birds in the background here are willets, and they'll wade in the deeper water. And you'll notice that at any place where there's water in shorebirds, that larger birds are often in this deeper water because they have longer legs. Um, but that's definitely oversimplification. But, but on, a, on a sort of a broad scale, this kind of habitat division is, is uh, noticeable. Uh, but of course, they're birds and they can fly and they can do whatever they want and they don't always go where you expect. This is a ruddy turnstone and uh, they're in Florida, usually on sandy beaches and other places. You could also find them in rocky beaches. Uh, this just happened to be in a yard though. So uh, 
on the dry tertiary beds and the grassy type lawn. Uh, so they don't always go where they're supposed to go. Uh, so, so you can use that as a clue, but just because a shorebird isn't where it's supposed to be, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's not what you think it, it might be. So, so you have to take all of these uh, identification clues in combination and uh, considering what other factors are, are you, you know, might be contributing to the bird's identification. Uh, and then for distribution, the last clue is the distribution in time. That's the seasonality. When are you seeing the bird? And so uh, you can see the black-bellied plover, BBPL, and American golden plover. I've got that written at the bottom. If you go into eBird and the, there's an explore tab, you can click on these things called bar charts and you can choose any country in the world or a state or a county or even an eBird hotspot, just an individual beach. And just about any place that's good to go find shorebirds will probably be an eBird hotspot. And then you can look at this chart and I just cho chose these two birds, but, but it'll have every species of bird that's recorded there. And you've got this uh, bar chart and when the bird is more common, the bar is thicker. When it's less common there, it's thinner. Uh, there are certain things that contribute to, the, to this too, like are people actually going out and bird watching in these areas at that time? So that kind of will affect uh, what that chart looks like. But you can see, we saw the, the black-bellied plover map earlier, and it showed that they weren't in Florida, in, that it just showed them in winter in Florida, but, but here you can see they're, they're in Florida year, year round. round. Uh, whereas the American golden plover, when would you expect to see that in Florida? Well, it's not very common at all. There's just a few records in spring and fall. Hey, sorry, in, in, I'm saying in Florida. This is in Venice County. So uh, they're, they're not that common at all there. But uh, I highly encourage you to look at eBird. If you, if you go into these bar charts and you click on this symbol, it's the little pin. That will show you a map of where the sightings are. And if you click at this symbol, it looks like a chart. That'll show you uh, the second symbol here after the BBPL. That'll show you different ways to visualize this data. And it's very interesting. Um, so the next clue to look at, and these first two clues, again, you may think, well, the first thing if you're trying to identify a bird is what does it look like? But these first two clues are going through subconsciously often for, from someone, an experienced person with bird identification. They've already not only narrowed it down to what's species of bird in the world might be here, but what might be here in this habitat or in this microhabitat and at this time of year. Then they're looking at behavior. Is the bird flying? Is it on the beach? If it's on the beach, is it walking? Is it running? Is it stopping? What is it doing? This is a turnstone. They're called turnstones, but in Florida, we don't really have stones on the beach. So that's a little unfortunate name for us. This guy's just turning over a little piece of uh, of, of seed or something like that. They'll flip over sand, they flip over shells. They, a better name would be uh, ruddy turn anything, but it just doesn't have the same ring to it, I think. Uh, but they turn over all kinds of stuff. They even bury their head all the way in, in the rack. Or to, uh, they're really strong. They can turn over really big things. That's a distinctive behavior that they have, a very strong bill. Um, if you travel in uh, the tropics, this doesn't, I haven't seen this happen in Florida, but if you're in the Caribbean and you're at a sort of beachside restaurant, you might even see them becoming beggars and landing on the railing of your restaurant trying to grab food off tables. They're really interesting. I did have one try to grab the meat out of the middle of my sandwich once when I wasn't looking. So behavior, uh, I'd like to break this down into two things. Sounds, because that's so important, even with shorebirds that you're thinking you might be mostly identifying them by sight, but sound is still very important. And then all other behaviors, just because there are so many different behaviors and you could spend the whole talk just talking about other shorebird behaviors and talk for two hours about that. That could be how they're looking for food, like the turnstone flipping over things, how they're resting, just their posture when they rest. It could be how they fly, what kind of flocking behavior, if they're in a tight flock or a loose flock, if they're, um, uh, aggressive or not, how they move. I'm going to talk about some more of those things. So the first one is sound. And does anyone know what these birds are? So they've got these long legs, and long thin bills, and they're both yellow legs, but I've uh, adjusted the size so that they both look like they're approximately the same size. So how would you tell the difference? Well, there's some subtle differences in and, and the bills are, are in the water, so you can't tell if that one on the left has a long or short bill. 
But if you hear them, the greater yellow legs is very vocal and it's a very loud three note call, very emphatic. And you'll often hear those before you see them. Whereas the lesser yellow leg, the, the bird on the left, they have a much softer call and it's often only two notes. So, so sound can be a great way to distinguish uh, two shorebirds. And, and uh, it's especially for the ones that, that look most similar. They're, they usually have very distinctive sounds. And this is another case of that. This is a short-billed dowitcher. And uh, there's a short-billed dowitcher and there is a long-billed dowitcher. And uh, the short-billed dowitcher's bill averages shorter than the long-billed dowitcher's. But in shorebirds, uh, the females for, for uh, at least most sandpipers have longer bills than the males. And then there's a lot of individual variability. So the longest female short-billed dowitcher bill might look pretty similar to the shortest male long-billed dowitcher bill. This is a juvenile short-billed dowitcher. And uh, I'm gonna talk about one other clue in a little bit to tell the dowitchers apart. But when they're juveniles, that's actually by far the easiest time to tell them apart because they've got uh, juvenile short-billed dowitchers have these little orange markings in the tertials. Those are the farthest back feathers at, uh, at the wing when the wing is folded there towards the tail. In the, in the long-billed dowitcher, those would be kind of silvery. But this is the sound clue. So this is, we got a short-billed dowitcher, but what if, what if you didn't have a good look at its tertials, it was too far away, or, or maybe it's an adult that looks more similar to the long-billed. The short-billed dowitcher gives this very distinctive three-note two-two-two call. Um, it's like a rapid series of two-two-two. Um, instead of saying, instead of two times, so it's three, it should be three-three-three. So I mean, that's two-two-two. Whereas the long-billed dowitcher gives a single keek note and um, these sounds are in birdie naps and online and things like that. So they're, those are good sounds to get to know. And there are subtle variations and things like that, that, you know, it's not always exactly like that. But if you learn those two, and then you pay attention as you're watching dowitchers, you'll usually hear them do, do a call just to confirm your ID if it's not a juvenile. So then all kinds of other behaviors are also useful for bird identification. This is a uh, semi-palmated plover, and, and we'll talk more about what makes a plover a plover and a sandpiper a sandpiper in, in a minute. But one of the things that's dis distinguishing between sandpipers and plovers is that plovers have a run-stop, run-stop feeding behavior. Well, they'll run really quickly and then they'll stop. They may stop and grab a bit of food from the top of the sand, not probing, um, or they may just stop and look around. But they're running and stopping, um, usually when they're feeding. Um, and so how is this semi-palmated plover holding its head? It's fairly high up, it's above, above its back. Um, so even within plovers, there's some different styles. This is a Wilson's plover, and these are the crab destroyers. They run around really fast on the beach and grab little crabs, and they hunch down. It seems like it just makes a more streamliner that can run faster when they do that. I'm not sure why they down, but they'll often run in a more horizontal posture than the semi-palmated uh, plovers. You don't see semi-palmated plovers running like this. The beak is also bigger, and we'll talk about that in, in a little bit. That was a Wilson's plover. Okay, now we're moving on to sandpipers. So as opposed to the run-stop, run-stop foraging behavior of, of plovers, sandpipers um, have this more active probing where they're putting their beak into the ground. and um, this is a sanderling. These are the guys that we looked at before that were running back and forth in the swash zone, right at the edge of where the water is coming in and out. And it looks like they're running while they're probing in the ground. They're actually briefly stopping because imagine you can't really run if your beak is poked into the ground, but they're moving so fast. It looks like they're running the whole time. Um, and they're just very, very active foragers. Uh, whereas here's another sandpiper. This again is a dowager. Do you remember which one based on the tertials? can't hear it. Uh, that's a short-billed dowitcher again. So dowitchers are also a type of sandpiper and they also probe, but they go more slowly than sanderlings and it's more sort of methodical and they're probing like a sewing machine in the water as opposed to the sanderling that's probing very quickly. Um, so they, dowitchers move a lot more slowly. So just these subtle things about um, the bird's behavior uh, can give you a clue to uh, what it might be. And here's another one. This is a common uh, shorebird inland. They also do show up on the beaches, but they're mostly inland at uh, lake margins or muddy areas. 
Um, this one's starting to get a little hint of its namesake right on its chest. If that's anyone want to guess what that is? All right, that's a spotted sandpiper. And if you've ever seen a spotted sandpiper when it's moving, think about how it moves. What does it do when it moves? What's the classic behavior of a spotted sandpiper? So they're almost always bobbing their tail. If my hand is the backside, they're almost bobbing, always bobbing it like that pretty regularly. Uh, whereas this is a solitary sandpiper. It's not even that closely related to the spotted sandpiper. And, and they move a lot too, but instead, of, and they'll bob their tail, but um, not as, as evenly uh, as a spotted sandpiper. But what they do that a spotted sandpiper doesn't really do is they bob their head. So they put their head up and down like that. And the spotted sandpiper doesn't really do that. So even if it's backlit in a really long ways away, if you see it bobbing its head, uh, you could think, well, no, that's, that's probably not a spotted sandpiper. Now, they do look a lot like a, a yellow legs, and, and yellow legs will bob their head sometimes too. So that's more of the trick. But, but interestingly, people will more often confuse solitary sandpipers with, with spotted sandpipers just because of the, that little bobbing motion. And then another thing to think about when you're looking at uh, shorebirds is as you're watching them, see what they're doing. And if you see them looking up at the sky, there's a good chance that they're looking up at a predator. They're always scanning around to see if there's a predator. But, but if they actually keep looking up, then they're kind of you know, paying close attention to something. That's a good clue to kind of do a quick scan and see if there's a, especially if they hunch down or something like that. That's almost certainly there's a predator nearby and they're trying to reduce their, their um, they're trying to blend in more with the, with the substrate. Um, and so you might look up in the sky and see a peregrine falcon or something like that fly by. And also be ready because that could be when a, uh, if the bird, if the strawbirds get flushed, that's a great time to look at them when they're flying because then you can compare them all. When they're foraging, sometimes one may be blocked by another one or maybe such a big flock, you're really not sure if you're missing some birds, but when they're flying, you can scan across and see if something sticks out and looks different. And then appearance, that's the clue that most people go to immediately. This is the snowy plover. And um, so these are on the west coast of Florida, but not the east coast of Florida. They're also in the inland interior west. And so plovers, uh, we talked about their run stop behavior. Uh, as far as appearance, they have big eyes and short stubby bills that I'll talk about more in, in a little bit. Um, and so I like to break down this appearance clue. <laughs> I should say clue three. I think I moved the clues around at some point. All right. Appearance, the clue for appearance is uh, structure, which is the shape and size, then the beaks or bills, and then finally patterns and colors of the birds. And so uh, let's look at structure. This is a black-bellied plover, and does it look bigger or smaller than the sandwich terns behind it? Uh, they're pretty close. So, well, maybe it looks a little bigger. The sandwich tern is a decent bit longer than the black-bellied plover, but the black-bellied plover is heavier. That's why when you're looking in your field guide, if you just look at length of a bird, you don't really get the full idea. So you might think, oh, no, that couldn't be a black-bellied plover because they're supposed to be a good bit smaller than those terns, but this thing actually looks like it's bigger. That's just because the tips of the tail and the beak is longer on the turn, um, but, but the plover weighs more. So if you consider the mass or the weight of the bird as well as the length, that gives you a better uh, perspective for judging size. But when, you, when you're judging size, you always want to judge it in, in, in comparison with something else. But humans, we think that we're really good at, or some people maybe think that they're good at judging the size of a bird when it's flying by. But if you see a bird by itself in the sky, you have absolutely no way to tell how big it is. And I, can, I know from experience that I've mistaken floaters in my eyes for birds or bugs flying by for birds or, or airplanes for birds. So, it, you know, it's the reason we think we can tell is because I think it's mostly based on the speed of the wing beat. You know, if you see a cattle egret and a great egret fly by, you'd say, oh, the cattle egret's a smaller bird, great egret's bigger. That's just because the cattle egret flaps its wings faster. There are a lot of other things like that too, but you, you really want to judge the size of a bird compared to something else nearby. So here we have how many different kinds of birds in this uh, slide. If you, 
if you can see your full screen, as I almost can't because of these other little things on there, there's one different one at the very top right. And then we've got in the middle, we've got a bunch of big gray ones, and then we've got some kind of orangey ones. And then look at this one here. This bird, if you can see my cursor, looks like it's the same shape and pretty close to the same pattern as this one, but it's the same size and shape as these. When, when shorebirds are flying around, they, they are uh, precocial, so they can, once they hatch, they can run around shortly after they hatch. Um, but once they start flying around, they're the same size as the adults when they're moving around a lot. And, and you know, it's not just like a little uh, cotton ball and toothpicks running around, but when they actually are, are, are migrating and moving away from the nest site, then, then they're the same size as an adult is. So this, this bird here is not a baby of this bird. This bird is the same size and shape and posture as, as all of these. And these, again, we saw these before. They had a longer bill when we could actually see it. And we see the little orange in the tertials. So these are less, I'm uh, sorry, short-billed dowagers. And just another um, thing about uh, uh, behavior is posture. Short-billed dowagers, uh, they're not as top-heavy as long-billed dowagers. So they sit, usually it's more horizontal, whereas long-billed dowagers are, are tilted a little bit more of an angle when they're sitting there. And I think that can be a good hint that if you notice a bunch of dowagers and one seems to be sitting differently, you might want to pay closer attention and see if that could possibly be a long-billed dowager. So these are short-billed dowagers. Well, what are these? We'll talk more about the, these guys in, in, in a little bit, but look how long the, the beaks are. And they're a good bit bigger. So these are our willets. And then this one up here is a black-bellied plover. OK, so another thing about structure is what's called primary projection. And that can be tricky to see. It can be pretty subtle. But it can also be very important and it can uh, give a bird a very uh, different uh, general shape, general impression. They look more elongated. This is a white rumped sandpiper. And the primaries, these are the, those black feathers right at the very tip of the wing, are longer than the tertials. Remember, the tertials from the dowitchers are these normally some of the longest feathers in shorebirds, but the really long distance migrants have longer wings. And uh, they're sticking out behind the tertials, a little bit behind the tail. So that's a, one of the things to look for. Baird sandpiper is another long distance migrant shorebird with, with uh, long primary projection. Um, so often the longer a bird flies, usually the longer its wings are going to be, the longer the migration is. All right, and then some of the things that can be tricky are things like perspective and uh, the, just the, in the moment that you see the bird. So, do these birds look like they're the same or different species? Or which one of these birds would you say is bigger? Well, they're both the same size, but the bird on the right just happens to be lower, a little bit lower down. And the bird on the left is fluffed up a little bit. And it's got its crown feathers raised. So they, the stru structurally, these two look fairly different in this photo. But if you watch them for a minute, you'd watch this guy on the right walk up the little sand here. And you'd see, oh, that's about the same size. And the, the one on the left would. Yeah, relax a little bit and it wouldn't look so fat or poofed up and its head feathers would go down so it wouldn't look so big. So that's one of the reasons that, that identifying birds from photos can be so tricky because you're just capturing one moment and a uh, bird can just be shifting its wings or moving its feathers around um, and, and they can look like they don't look for, for most of the time. They can get a really unusual appearance briefly. Um, and this is a, a sanderling in, in the breeding plumage like, like they are right now. And I'll talk more about that in just a second. Um, but the second clue for appearance is bills or beaks. And that for shorebirds is really one of the most important things. For a lot of birds, beaks are super important, but especially for shorebirds because they're so variable. Now, this is a willet and just in silhouette. So you're not distracted by any, any colors or anything like that. And, how long would you say the willet's beak is compared to the length of its head or compared to from the where the base of the bill is, where it hits the head, and from where that is to the back of the head? How long is that bill? Well, it's pretty long, isn't it? If you kind of zoom in and put a little, you know, some lines on, on the head, you can see, wow, that, that beak is almost twice as long as the head. That's pretty distinctive. And in a greater yellow legs, which is, more closely related to a willet than it is to a lesser yellow legs, 
they have a, same, a very similar bill structure. Whereas lesser yellow legs, if you look at that, that bill, it's about the same length as the head. And again, remember, there's this variability in shorebird bill lengths where the females in, in a lot of, the, especially the longer billed shorebirds like uh, yellow legs and willets and curlews and goblets and things like that. Females have longer bills and there's a lot of individual variation. So imagine if you took uh, this, the front of that bird's bill and just pushed it backwards into its head, it would actually not stick out the back. That's about an average lesser yellow legs bill. I'd, the longest ones would stick out just a little bit and the shortest ones would not stick out at all. <clears throat> And then this becomes useful even in, in some trickier birds like these, these two. This is Western and semi-palmated sandpipers. And if you think about it, uh, those are some of the hardest uh, shorebirds to identify, uh, but one of the best clues is bill length. And even though, just like in the dowitchers, there's it even more so than the dowitchers, there's some overlap in the longest male of the shorter billed species and the shortest female of the longer billed longest female of the shortest built species and the shortest male of the longest built species, there's overlap. But in general, you see these next to each other. Which one of these two birds in the front has a longer bill? This could help. The one on the left is a western sandpiper. And the bill is definitely longer than the head. And the one on the right is a semi-palmated sandpiper and that bill is definitely shorter than the head. And again, there's there's, there's variability. If you just see one individual bird and it's, a, it's sort of unusually uh, to one extreme or another, it can be tricky. But um, if you see a bunch of them moving around, you'll, you'll get a feeling pretty quickly for, for that bill length thing. All right, and then you've got your plovers. Plovers all have these uh, very different bills than sandpipers. Sandpipers have little uh, receptors in the tips of their bill. They feed by probing. They, they're sticking their bill into the dirt, um, and plovers don't do that. They're just picking stuff off the top of the, the sand or mud. That's why they've got this nice little point to their, their beak. They're not probing it into the dirt. Um, they're mostly, they're, uh, and this is a semi-palmated uh, plover, one of our most common wintering plovers here. And I, I tried to do this into uh, silhouettes, but got this effect instead, and this seems to do the same trick. I just not be distracted by colors or anything else and just look at the bill. On the left shows you some variation in plover bills and on the right shows you variation in some of the shorter billed sandpiper bills. So you'll, if you look at the bills on the left, the, the top's a, uh, a piping plover, the middle is a Wilson's plover, and the bottom's a black belly plover. They're all fairly more or less parallel sided, a little bit thicker at the base but not a lot, and then usually just a little bit bulbous at the tip and they all come to this kind of abrupt sharp point. Um, and the, even the longest billed ones, like the, the Wilson's plover here, that's not even nearly uh, as long as the head. I mean, it may be just a little bit, if you flipped it backwards, just a little bit past the back of the eye. Um, and then if you look on the right, we've got a semi-palmated sandpiper on the top, a western sandpiper here in the middle, and a sanderling in the bottom. Those bills are blunt tip. They're, they've got almost sometimes like a little um, the bulbous tip, but they're not real pointy like these plover bills, and they're probing them into the ground, and they usually have a slight bit of a curve one way or another on them. Um, and even the shortest one, the shortest one here is, is a semi-palmated sandpiper. That is comparatively still almost a little bit longer than the Wilson's plover. Here they are in real life. You can see what those, those beaks look like. And um, just imagine, th these are all great for running really fast and stopping and grabbing something real, could be really small or not that small, just grabbing uh, very precisely from the top of the sand. These are all made for probing into the sand. So you can narrow a bird down, even if you can't tell what kind of sandpiper it is, maybe it's a weird looking something in between a Western like this Western or in this uh, semi-palmated some in-between length build, but at least you're going to know, okay, that's a, it's maybe a semi-palmated to western, and I'll talk a little bit more about plumage and some other things later to tell some uh, other species apart, but you could, you can tell a plover from a sandpiper pretty quickly, and then within, within, so you narrow it down to that group, which family is it in, plovers or sandpipers, and of course there, there are two other families of shorebirds in, in, in Florida, there's the, um, 
the oyster catchers, and there's only one member of that family in, in Florida, the American oyster catcher. They're very distinctive, and I'm not going to go into detail about those. And then there's the family that includes the stilts and avocets. And both of those are also very distinctive, and I'm not going to go into any detail on those. So, so shorebirds belong to either the plover family, like these four, on, the three on the left, the sandpiper family, like these three on the right, or the stilt avocet family, and the oyster catcher family in Florida. And, Across the world, there are lots of other really cool shorebird families that uh, at some point it'd be fun to just do a talk about all the shorebird families of the world, but I have to go see them first, I think. All right, so you may be wondering, a bird like this marbled god with that really long beak, how does it grab anything? If it sticks its bill into a hole in the mud, how can it grab onto a worm or whatever it's trying to get? Because it's, you know, imagine you stick a tweezers into a hole, you can't open them up. Well. Uh, all the shorebirds that are grabbing things in the mud have this slightly prehensile tip to their bill. This is pretty obvious here. That which you're sometimes you'll see them opening up and it's, it's pretty obvious when they do it too. It's the top mandible and uh, they just open that up and grab uh, whatever they're, they're probing at way deep down in the sand so they can pull it out. So that, that, there's that mystery salt. What if it doesn't have a head though and you can't see the bill and you don't have anything nearby for a comparison size, well then you're going to finally want to look at patterns and colors. Like this least sandpiper with yellow legs and a darker brownish back. So patterns and colors is the last thing. You've already got your first clue. Where in the world is it? And what time of year is it? And what kind of habitat is it using? Then you, you go to your second clue. What's it doing? The behaviors. Is it running and stopping like a plover? Is it constantly probing foraging very actively like a sandpiper? Um, is it bobbing in a certain way like a spotted or solitary sandpiper? Then you looked at the overall structure. Did you have something nearby to compare it with as far as for, um, for size? Um, is it a longer, longer wing like a white rump sandpiper? And then you look at the beak, is it a plover bill? Is it a sandpiper bill? And finally, you're down to your patterns and colors, which is colors are often the first thing people look at, um, but that really should be one of the last things. And uh, this is one that it, we get in the winter in, in Florida on our beaches. And, and this picture it just kind of blows my mind because of how well the bird's head and back blend into the sand. It looks like I got on there and did some kind of Photoshop and tried to blend those two, but I promise you I didn't. That's just how it looks naturally. Um, so you, you already know that um, based on just this bird's beak and the big eye that this is some kind of plover. And it's real pale backed and it's also one of the smaller plovers. Uh, they're the ones with the rings around the neck. Um, so you've got to narrow down to the smaller plovers. If you want to get fancy, you could call it the caradrius plovers. Um, and then you go, okay, well, it's got uh, oh, this little bit of a ring. It's got a very pale back. That's the pale back. Um, and, and it's in Florida and it's in the wintertime in, in Venice, you could say, somewhere around, around you guys. All right, so what else do we got? Well, we got the bright kind of orangey legs. Let's see if it were a, a, a snowy plover, like we saw earlier, it'd have darker legs. So this has got to be a piping plover. All right, so the plumages of the shorebirds can, uh, the, the, the other reason that, that leaving um, colors to the end is the plumages are variable. The shape, this is a sanderling, this shape is not going to change. Uh, they're going to stay the same size and shape all year round for their whole life once they're a few weeks old. But the plumage changes a lot. This is how we see sanderlings most of the time with this uh, kind of pale gray back. And uh, sometimes you can see this black uh, edge of the wing, but often that's covered up. But they're just very, very pale overall. Uh, but at this time of year, they are really beautiful when they're getting their breeding plumage. And you could call it the breeding plumage, or another name for it is the alternate plumage. They have it for just a shorter period of the year. And I highly recommend, if you haven't gone out and seen shorebirds in this plumage, that you go out to whatever beaches you can. And, um, you know, Tiger Tail Beach, I know that's a ways down in Marco Island, but that's a great place for shorebirds. And you guys have a few nice beaches there where you should be able to see Lido Be Key, I think is one, where, where there are um, shorebirds. And if you go right now in the next week or so, you'll still be seeing some of these shorebirds coming through in this breeding plumage. Um, but 
if you're in, in summer and you see a bird that looks more like this, this winter plumage or the non-breeding plumage, uh, also called the basic plumage, uh, what that probably is is a young bird that didn't migrate north to breed and it didn't migrate into that fancy breeding plumage. Um, so the, there are, for a lot of species of shorebirds, young birds that spend the year, like we were talking about with the blackbird clover, um, they'll spend the whole year in Florida and they just aren't, um, uh, usually by, by midsummer, those are the ones that are not gonna be breeding and they're just hanging around, waiting to grow up a little bit, get another year older and go migrate north to breed. So here's the breeding plumage or alternate plumage, Sandra Lane, and then, what happens to that plumage by the end of the summer? That guy's probably a male because it's pretty bright. Um, it's coming back down to Florida after breeding up in the Arctic and its plumage is kind of worn out. And so it's not that bright of a plumage um, and it's losing these feathers and it's looking like that first one we saw that more white color. But you also have the youngsters. This is a juvenile. And how does that plumage differ from the other plumages? Well, the most noticeable thing in the sanderling is you've got these dark centers to the feathers. They're also all very even um, because the juvenile birds are growing in all these feathers at the same time. So let's see how much remember, we remember. I'm just going to get three of these plumages. See if you can name that plumage. All right. When would you see this one, the sanderling? How about this one? How old is that? Is that young or old? And then What's going on with this? Why is that so bright? All right, so juvenile, it's just coming down here. They hold that for a little while, a few months. You can see that anywhere till you know, late fall, early winter, but usually it's maybe only a couple of months. It's the best time to see the juvenile plumage is late summer, really early in the fall. Then the breeding or alternate plumage, that's spring. Uh, there's, they've got that right now. And um, I didn't, I'm not showing the, the worn breeding plumage here, but then this is the non-breeding plumage that we see basic plumage most of the year. Another thing to think about when you're looking at um, plumage details is how the light affects it. Now these are all least sandpipers, even though some of them, like this guy here looks more brown and some of these here look almost really dark, those birds are just in a little bit of a shadow. And that becomes really dramatically illustrated when one second later the whole flock turns and they go from looking brown to looking almost blackish. So if you just get a photo of this again, you'd think, what are these really, these black birds flying along? Right? It could be really confusing, but if you snap a couple photos and you get them going that way and that way, it's very helpful. It's useful to watch the bird for a while. And then here's a little kind of a, a, a bonus field mark that you do not see in field guides. And this is, a, uh, so, I've mentioned taking photos several times, and it's really useful for, for all kinds of birds, not just for documenting things, but also for learning. And these, these were long-billed dowagers that flew by, and uh, they weren't calling. But if you notice where this red arrow is pointing, th these are called the uh, lesser underwing coverts. This area right here is very pale. I had to lighten this up so you could see it well. But it contrasts with the rest of the wing. Long-billed dowagers usually show that. If you can get a photo of the underwing, short-billed dowagers don't show that. So that's that's a sort of a secret field mark that you don't have in the field in the field guides usually, um, although it is mentioned in, in the shorebird guide that I'll talk about later. All right, so I'm going to go into a little detail about three species of shorebird that are common in Sarasota County that are good reference species for anywhere in the whole world actually, because shorebirds have a worldwide distribution. Um, the first one, if you remember this one, does anyone remember what that is? All right, that's a willet. And the tringa, do you remember the other birds in the genus tringa? There are two, one of them showed up as in the top 10. Those are the yellow legs. And then we also talked about one that has a head bobbing movement. That's the um, solitary sandpiper. So tringa uh, shorebirds have the long bill, medium long to long legs. Willet is an interesting one because they're in Florida year, year round. Some maps might only show them here in the winter, but they actually do breed here, so that would be incorrect. Um, this is a Western Willet, and I'll go into a little more detail about Western versus Eastern Willets in a minute. Um, but it's a large gray, uh, darker gray above, paler below shorebird that um, is, is very common in the winter in Florida and less common in the summer. And, uh, other birds in that genus, Tringa, are common uh, all over the world. The shorebirds are on every continent except for Antarctica. And this is a very common genus. So 
if you're in the old world somewhere, you're in Australia or Africa or Europe, and you see a bird that looks like a willet, well, it's probably not a willet, but you've already narrowed it down from all the shorebirds in the world to something that there's only gonna be a few choices. And then you start looking at, well, did it make a sound? Where exactly is it? What kind of habitat? What's the leg color or the, you know, more or less how long is the beak or what kind of patterns do you see? So this is that same uh, willet in uh, breeding plumage. This is just recently. Um, these are the ones that are feeding more out uh, in deeper water sometimes, much bigger prey like the sand flea, it's also called a mole crab. And they've got this pale kind of barring below, long beak. But then in Florida and, and up the East Coast and the Gulf Coast, we have uh, these birds, which are called, oh, they're also willets and they're still the same species, but these are the Eastern willets. They're shorter, um, shorter legged above their knees, or they, these are actually the ankle, um, and it's shorter here. And they have a shorter beak and it's a little bit thicker. And they're also more heavily marked below the Eastern Willet. One other thing about an Eastern Willet compared with the Western Willet is Eastern Willets like to perch up on things. They'll perch up on a post or on a power line or something like that. And you almost never see a Western Willet perched up. So if you're just driving along and you kind of see a Willet out of the corner of your eye on top of a telephone pole, it's almost guaranteed to be a Eastern Willet. So you probably have a Willet breeding nearby. Here's a western willet for comparison. And again, there's variability in the bill length and just lots of individual vari variability. But you can see, in general, how much longer that beak is and then how much longer the leg is above the ankle. And uh, so the other thing about a willet is they've got that classic pale gray above and whitish below plumage. And um, when they fly, though, this, this wing pattern is just dramatic, the black and white. And that is super noticeable, even from a long distance. These guys, oh, they're also flying behind me right now. Um, those, you can see that from maybe even a mile away. Um, so, so thinking that if, you, if you're not sure what the bird is when you watch it fly, that can be a really helpful tool. All right, so here's our typical beach scene. Which one of those is the willet? All right, well, remember it's got the long beak, long legs, and they're foraging a little deeper out there in the water. So those are the willets in the back, and we've got some sanderlings up here in the front in the splash zone. And speaking of sanderlings, that's our next bird, uh, Calidris alba. Again, the name sanderling doesn't tell you anything about how what this bird looks like or what it's related to. You could maybe guess that it likes the sand, but that's, you know, that's about it. But if you look at the scientific name, the first word of the genus, Calidris, there are more species of shorebirds in that genus in any other genus, I'm, I'm pretty sure. And um, so if you have a bird narrowed down to the genus Calidris, you've already knocked out all your tringas that are longer legged and longer beaked and a little bit different structurally, longer necked, and all your plovers, because that's not, uh, not even the same family. Um, and then you're just starting to narrow it down, like which one of these birds that look like this could be in this area at this time of year, and then doing this behavior and with this plumage. So sanderlings are very pale, pale backed, very pale on their face, whitish forehead. They have black legs. They don't have a rear toe, but that's not really a great field mark. It's tough and hard to see. Um, and they're very active foragers. These are the guys that are always running back and forth, super active on the beach. And, and uh, one great place to watch shorebirds, if, if you find shorebirds where there are a lot of, on beaches where there are a lot of people, if you just sit still, and you can just sit on the beach and they'll come almost right up to you. They, they can get very used to people on the beach. So if you wanna just hang out on the beach quietly and watch them, sanderlings are, are really fun to watch. And you can, at this time of year, it is just great because looking at all the different plumages. The other time where there are even more plumages is late summer, early fall. And you've got the worn breeders coming back and the, and the juveniles coming back. So usually they play well together in these little groups, but. They also, sanderlings are especially famous for this, for being kind of jerks. And they get, uh, they get a nice place on the beach. They've got a little bit of good foraging area and they'll chase other birds away. So they'll, other sanderlings especially, they put their back feathers up and they run at the other birds and they do a little growl and they just chase them away. And it's kind of fun to watch, They're actually kind of cute. Um, and uh, some of my palmated sandpipers are also fairly aggressive, but especially, but those are, that's mainly here in the, the springtime. 
So sanderlings, they've got that whitish back, but what about this? Is this a sanderling? It is a sanderling, it's just backlit. So even though um, if you've got the good light, you're gonna see how pale they are. Even something as pale as a sanderling can look really dark if the light's bad. Uh, this picture also illustrates that, that uh, wing, uh, big broad stripe in the wing. That's uh, just, well, several shorebirds have that, but usually sanderlings have that too. So which one of these is a sanderling? Well, we just saw a flying one that was dark. It just has that one line and it's got that pale back and real pale head. Uh, these other two are ruddy turnstone with this really crazy dark light, dark light plumage. How about these? Which ones of which birds here are sanderlings? This is a little trickier. There are three species here, not four. So you can see, let's see here, we got, well, let's see, is that bigger or not? Well, I don't know, maybe it's just standing up a little bit higher and it's got its head up just a little bit more alert. So, and these, these are, these look the same. So this might be the same as these, in fact it is. And then this is smaller and that's, is it lower or smaller? It's actually a little bit smaller. So these are sanderlings and they're not in their breeding plumage in their basic plumage, or maybe they're youngsters. This is a sanderling in breeding plumage. This is a slightly smaller than, it's a semi-plumated sandpiper. And then this one that's even smaller and browner. And this, this is a little browner than the sanderling, semi-plumated sandpiper. Then even more browner than this, the semi-plumated sandpiper is a least sandpiper. And you can also just barely see these yellow legs. The yellow legs on the least sandpiper is a good clue if they're in clean water and they're up in a dry beach, but uh, if the lighting's bad or if they're in the mud, they can, their legs can either be in a shadow in the black or they can get covered in mud and look black. And the, the reverse can also happen. I've misidentified a semi-palmated sandpiper when its legs were wet and the light was shining on it and I thought they were yellow because they just looked, they were reflecting light and they looked yellow. But um, So if you're using some clues, when you're trying to identify a bird, you're using a combination of clues. And uh, two things you want to ask yourself is, one, are the clues I'm using to identify this bird actual identification clues or, or is you know saying the bird has a a rounded head. Well, these these all have the sort of same shape head, so that's not a good clue for these. If one had a really pointy bill then and, and shorter, that might be a plover, but they don't. And there is a difference in bill length. So you want to first question when you ask yourself is is this clue an actual good clue to identify the bird? And the second question is, am I really seeing this? And that's what you want to ask yourself, especially for things like leg color, which can be very hard to see. All right, so we're moving on to our next species. Is that a sandpiper or is it a plover? What do you think? Well, it's a black bellied plover, Pluvialis squatterola. I like to say that with an Italian accent because this is a word from old Venice, squatterola, um, just a word they use for, for plovers. Uh, so it's a plover because it's got this stubby, thick bill with a little point here. And it's also a pretty big eye, nice big uh, head, rounded head. Um, and uh, so these guys are here, as we saw in the eBird bar chart, year round. Uh, they are more common in the winter um, and, and even more common in the fall when they're passing through, but, but they're, they're here all year round. And um, they're the classic plover for foraging behavior where they run, stop, run, stop, grab some food, run, stop. And um, these are the largest plovers that we have in Florida, uh, bigger than golden plovers, the other rare one that we um, briefly spoke about. And why are they called? Oh, in, in Europe, these are called gray plovers, which kind of makes sense. Uh, but we call them black bellied plovers, named after the breeding plumage. Uh, and when this guy gets his full breeding plumage, in, if this is a male, it will, it will be all all black here, and it's an absolutely striking, beautiful bird. And these are on the beaches right now, and they're getting, this was taken a week or two, a couple weeks ago, so they'll, they're, you should be able to find some pretty nice plumage uh, black belly plovers, right? Really beautiful ones. If you're on the East Coast, Merritt Island is great, uh, Anastasia, Northeast Florida, Huguenot Park on the West Coast, I mentioned a few other places, uh, Tampa Bay area has a lot of good shorebird spots. Um, so, Here's a black bellied plover. Still, the structure is the same, same beak, same head, same behaviors also, but the plumage looks kind of weird. And if you're just, if you're not thinking about things like behavior and structure, 
and you zone, you zoom, you focus in on plumage right away, you might start going, oh, wait a minute, I saw this bird and it's got this V on its chest and could throw you off like a hybrid between a meadowlark and a plover or something. That, that, that's just, that is just getting its plumage in and it, they, they, they don't change overnight from their non-breeding to their breeding plumage. It takes a while. And so as they're changing those, growing into new feathers, um, they can, you can get some kind of weird looking birds like this. That's why looking at structure is really important. And then on black belly plover, it's the only bird in, in North America, only shorebird, that has these distinctive black armpits. And, and whereas on the long-billed dowager, that, that, that pale spot on the leading edge of the underwing, whereas that is really hard to see with binoculars, it's better in a photo, this thing you can see really well. You can see this from a long ways away, this black spot. And uh, the golden plover that we mentioned before, they do not have that black spot. So if you see a big plover, big stubby bill and big eye, about the size of a black belly plover compared to whatever it happens to be around, but it, it doesn't have a black spot under the wing, that's when you want to try to get some photographs to document a, uh, a American golden plover maybe, or some other kind of golden plover in your area. All right. What are these two birds? So, beak long or short? Beak long or short? A little bit longer legs, a little bit shorter legs, a little paler. This is a willet with a long beak, longer than the head. This is actually not as long as the one we looked at before, but still longer than that. Really tall, long legs. And this guy, a little bit smaller, and uh, that shorter beak with a little point. And then here's some flying birds. This is kind of, you know, not, I, I could have shown close up pretty pictures of all these birds, but that's not how you see them always in real life. This some kind of maybe stormish conditions, but even in when the light's not great, you can see up there's kind of, it looks like there's probably two. There's this guy, which if you remember from before, anyone remember that one? It's really dramatic, distinctive pattern on the back. That's a ready turnstone. And then, do they have black armpits? Yep, these are black belly plover. You can't see this one, but this one, this one, and definitely this one, all black armpits. So these are black belly plovers. And here's the thing, even if you know about this field mark, it's fun to try to see it. So if you're watching a black belly plover on the beach, you know, okay, black belly plover, I've got that one down. Let's look at something else. If you see it fly, try to watch it with your binoculars. See how far away you can see it. See at what distance, because you can't see this from, from 500 yards away probably, especially, or if they're backlit, you can't see it. So under at what distance and under what lighting conditions can you and can't you see that? Um, so on to some resources here. Uh, this is my favorite uh, shorebird book. There are, there are lots of shorebirds books out there, and most of them are, are more similar to a, a field guide. And I, I'm, you know, I think you could just look at a field guide like the, um, Sibley guide or something like that. There's some great field guides out there. But this book I really like because it gives you lots of different photographs of the birds. It gives you lots of comparison uh, pictures of the birds. It even gives you little quiz photos. And then um, there's a lot of good detailed text. So this is, if you're gonna get one shorebird book, I would definitely recommend this book, The, the Shorebird Guide by Brian Crossley and Carlson. And then if you're going anywhere in the old world, uh, especially if you're going to Africa, this book is great. Uh, this is uh, Waiters of um, Southern Africa. And uh, this guy also, by the way, has the best bird person name of anyone, Fancy Peacock. Uh, in this book, uh, you can also buy it on, get PDF online for 15 bucks or something like that. If you just Google Chamberlain's Waiters. Waiters in the old world is what they call shorebirds. Whereas if you're in North or South America, we're calling them shorebirds if you're speaking in English usually. Um, and the nice thing about this book is it goes into lots of detail about all kinds of things like nesting, individual feather patterns, feet, bills, all kinds of stuff like that, sorry. Um, and uh, uh, it, it's a great overview on, on all kinds of things that I spoke about today. And it's also beautifully illustrated. So, so if you're planning on traveling overseas or you just want a cool resource you want, um, you can get this immediately, I think, online as a PDF um, for not too much. And this is a great book too. Then there's this other neat resource. If you just Google Birds Caribbean, which is a great organization to support, 
and then Shorebird Resources, they've got these posters you can download in English, Spanish, and French, and maybe one other language. And it's common shorebirds of the Caribbean, which also includes Florida. So it's all the same shorebirds. And um, they're all lined up in, from smallest to largest. Um, it's the co most common ones. It doesn't show the really rare things. But this is a cool poster. It comes out to be like four feet long or something like that. But you, could, you could print that up if you want. It's a neat resource. And then um, during Kate's talk, Someone had asked something about what are some important shorebird sites, and I, I couldn't figure out how to unmute. And I just thought, uh, I'm just going to get on in here. And I, and I didn't even bother to try to get on because I you knew I could have more time to talk about it now. But this, this organization and the conglomeration of, of groups, the Western Hemisphere Shorebird Reserve Network, uh, this you can Google that website, and, and um, they've got really good information about shorebirds and climate change, which is what. A lot of people want to know about how they're being impacted by climate change, and I don't have time to get into all that stuff now. It also has an interactive map. This is just a screenshot of the map uh, showing the most important shorebird sites that at least have been nominated. So there are, this is not, it doesn't include everything, but this in general is a lot of the most important shorebird sites in the Western Hemisphere. And we're just looking at North America now, of course. So the blue dots, Delaware Bay, this, uh, and that's a, a hemispheric, so in for the whole North. Western Hemisphere, a very important shorebird site. Uh, this little orange dot just north of Florida here is the Jekyll Island area, a great place for shorebirds. And you can just go on and click on any of those dots and get a lot of information about the time of year and what birds use it and all that. In Florida, the Florida Shorebird Alliance is an excellent, excellent, uh, also kind of conglom conglomeration of, of organizations. You've got Audubon of Florida, the uh, Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and <clears throat> this uh, alliance helps shorebirds in a couple of ways. There are lots of different kinds of surveys you can do, and there are also beach stewards that protect uh, beach nesting birds, not, not only shorebirds, but, um, but a lot of them are shorebirds, also gulls and terns from, from disturbances. But there are neat resources in here, like um, quizzes and things like that. There's interesting information in the field notes section. There's how to get involved. And in there, you can also find out how to report banded birds like this red knot. So lots of shorebirds are declining, as you may have heard, uh, various reasons. Uh, imagine how popular beaches are with people. Um, <clears throat> and then also think of uh, habitat destruction, including on the breeding grounds and various other things. But especially um, disturbance is on, on important stopover and um, uh, beach sites. Um, so a lot of the shorebirds are being studied. And um, so in addition to the classic metal band that um, has a numbers on it, uh, they'll often have these color bands. And if you see a color banded shorebird, note which leg the color bands are on, the position of the color, and the position of the band above or below the ankle. And then you can Google Florida Shorebird Alliance or just report banded birds and you'll figure out It'll tell you how to report those bands, and you'll get a report back once you report them on when the bird was banded and where else it was sighted, usually. Um, last slide is a bird quiz, so just absorb this for a minute. Hopefully this, this talk has given you some of the tools you need to narrow down a scene like this. So if you run across this as you're walking down the beach, you don't just turn and run away and scream but you go, wow, this is a great opportunity to try to practice identifying some shorebirds. So take a quick look at this and see how many different species you think there are, if they're sandpipers or plovers, how many different sizes, and then we'll talk about this for a second. This is almost my last slide. All right, so this is a little bit cheating because I'm showing you there are five different birds of the seven total. So we're on East Florida, so that means there's no snowy plovers here probably. And it's in the middle of the winter, so there would be no semi-palmated sandpipers if you know your distribution of, of these things, time and space. Um, they're not really doing any kind of a unusual behavior right now. They're basically just resting. Um, but if you look at structure, there's a couple that look bigger, like three here looks bigger than two there. This one looks a little bit bigger than two there. This five is a little bigger than this four. And then if you look at the beak, well, this five, that's a, pretty big beak, but it's still not nearly as long as the head, and it's got that little plover point. So for a plover with a big beak, and it's a collared plover, that the only collared or some of the smaller plovers with a big beak is a Wilson's plover. Well, then there's another one that's pretty similar. 
and we didn't go into detail on all these, so, so just obviously didn't have enough time. Um, this is a semi-palmated plover, much smaller bill, a um, little bit shorter legs. Um, all right, so there's two plovers. These are different. Let's see here. This one is a little bigger than these little ones, and it's very pale. This is going to be a sanderling. And then we've got just these, and this one's beak is out, but you can't really see it because it blends in the background. Let's look at these two. This one's a little bigger and got darker on the darker chest. So if this is a real small one, if it were least, it'd have more brown on the back and more brown on the chest. So this is a Western sandpiper, and so is this. This is bigger, it's got a little darker chest, um, but otherwise pretty similar. It's also the same genus as the Western. These are both calidrous. This is a Dunlin, and then this one's a Dunlin. So we've got Western, number two, Sanderling, number one, Dunlin, number three, semi-palmated plover, number four, and Wilson's plover, number five. So I don't expect everyone to be able to just run out there in the beach and immediately be able to do that. But um, at least when you start looking at them, you'll know, all right, let's see here. We, we know what should be here and when. We can narrow it down. We got plovers versus sandpipers. And um, let's start looking at relative size, something about the pattern on the chest, white or dark, um, color of the back, things like that. And you might, you might have it narrowed down. These are actually, this is a hard to do, you know. You might just narrow these down to a little bit bigger and a little smaller sandpiper. And then watch them for a while, maybe get some more clues as the Dunlin pulls out its beak and you see how long it is. But um, if you've narrowed this down to a bunch of sandpipers and a couple kinds of plovers and maybe Wilson's plover here, you're, you're actually doing pretty good if you're just starting out. So hopefully this has been useful and inspired you to get out there and, and uh, watch some shorebirds and some of their fun behaviors and, um, and, and maybe try to take a closer look at some of the details about them. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have about shorebirds now.